Wisdom. Prudentia. Justice. Justicia. Temperance. Temperantia. Courage. Fortitudo. Applying ancient philosophy to modern life, this is the Sunday Stoic. Welcome to the Sunday Stoic. On today's episode, we'll be joined again by Kai Whiting and discussing his article on the Daily Stoic entitled, Taking Stoicism Beyond the Self, The Power to Change Society. On Clemency by Seneca No school has more goodness and gentleness. None has more love for human beings, nor more attention to the common good. The goal which it assigns to us is to be useful, to help others, and to take care, not only of ourselves, but of everyone in general, and of each one in particular. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, Book 2 For we are made for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of the upper and lower teeth. To act against one another, then, is contrary to nature and it is acting against one another to be vexed and to turn away. Our recent podcast guest, Kai Whiting, has been stirring the pot online with a recent blog post on The Daily Stoic, Taking Stoicism Beyond the Self, The Power to Change Society. Kai, what's going on, man? I know, it's great to be back on. I did not expect to be on quite so quickly. I mean, I am irritating, but I'm not normally that irritating. So, yeah. <laughs> I just felt there was a natural progression because the feedback uh, that, that we got after the podcast and after the article was, okay, aren't humans just naturally selfish? Uh, you say that rash, being ra- we, we, we see that in stoicism that everyone has a capacity to be rational, and then you say that rational is to uh, progress towards the four virtues. But in reality, people are selfish, they're unkind. Uh, doesn't Darwin talk about competition between species? So how do you how do you leave your stoicism? Because you say that stoicism says one thing, but the reality I see is the other. Is stoicism not a utopia? So it kind of it did actually link to really what is we went from what is it to be human to what really is human nature. So I felt that a blog piece to kind of say, well, stoicism does talk about society. And we do have a commitment to that beyond, say, not in tuna that I spoke about last time. We actually have a commitment to each other, even though, for example, Silicon Valley stoicism might suggest that our main emphasis is on personal philosophy. So I thought, take the opportunity to, again, stir the pot, but hopefully answer some doubts that people had and then create a few more. So I'm really looking forward to conversing some things with you and seeing if we can get to some answer or another. We need to distinguish Stoicism from objectivism in a way almost. Uh, Ayn, Ayn Rand's uh, uh, philosophy, uh, which is sort of that selfish self kind of a, a viewpoint. Yeah, the, or the selfish gene, which I, I mean, I really find an interesting, fascinating book. But how far can one take the selfish gene? What does it exactly mean? I mean, it was, I think it was published, well, certainly the 80s, mid 80s. And so how far do we understand selfish? Does selfish include altruism for selfish reasons? Or does it literally mean, as people take it to mean, that it's a zero sum game, that if you reproduce, then I don't. If you succeed, then I don't. If you find a mate, I don't. So I just wanted to talk to you, Steve, as a, as a biologist and somebody who works in parts of the evolutionary field about what you, how you interpret uh, Darwinian memes and uh, Darwinian thinking, which is what has been applied, for example, by Jordan Peterson. So everything means a difference, so there's discrimination. You say, well, that is natural. That's part of the Darwinian approach to how we have developed in society. So I just wanted to ask you your opinion and then feed in, hopefully, to it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see what I can do. The Darwinian perspective that survival of the fittest, which is... Uh, as I'm sure many of the listeners know, is not survival of the uh, the one who goes to the gym. Fitness in the evolutionary sense is the ability to survive long enough to reproduce and have lots of offspring. So, so those who, who leave the most genes behind win in that sense. Uh, and that, by, ne- by definition, often leads us to think of uh, an, an organism being quite selfish, trying to... Uh, 
to spread their seed as much as possible, to leave behind as many offspring as possible. And that's been uh, the historical view in, in, a, in a lot of ways uh, from the Dar Darwinian times, uh, Dar Darwin's day to the present. But I think in more modern uh, times, there is a, uh, a, a lot of people focusing more on altruism and cooperation and, and how, how uh, a group of organisms benefit over time by cooperating together. And we see human beings doing that uh, quite a ways back. In fact, I was just watching a show on Mesopotamia the other day, and and you you can't form a uh, go from a band of hunter gatherers to a to a city like that without a tremendous amount of cooperation that goes probably beyond uh, just basic selfishness. I mean, absolutely. We discussed on the last podcast that it was cumulative uh, culture, the ability to stand on the shoulders of the others and see further, um, and we learned that. Human beings have a tremendous ability to cooperate, more so than definitely more so than chimpanzees, and even more so than the animals, is where the evidence is is pointing. So I would say that our greatest evolutionary advantage is our ability to cooperate on mass to get, you know, seven uh, billion people to agree that money is something that's worth uh, a certain resource, including food or shelter or a computer. But money in itself is nothing. It's a concept. Right. So seven billion people agree, regardless of their religion, that money is very important. Yet money does not exist as a physical thing. It's just a creation of man and women or man, humankind and how we decided to distribute goods and services. So if you try to tell a chimpanzee, look, I'll swap three bananas for that you know, $20 bill because that $20 bill is worth more than the three bananas, that chimpanzee is not going to do it. There's right. no way of being able to reason with them. So I think our greatest strength is the ability to cooperate and the ability to, unfortunately, sometimes excessively dominate the world, precisely because we've managed en masse to cooperate, to build structures, to communicate across the globe, to put you know, cables down, where a chimpanzee or an ant or potentially wouldn't be able to have done that. So I see that the Darwinian advantage is precisely the opposite, it's the ability to cooperate. And I wanted to like to ask you like when cooperation actually helps you preserve genes as opposed to spreading wide your seed as you put it. I would imagine that cooperation evolved quite early in in uh, lots of organisms. Maybe originally as a selfish uh, uh, had a selfish origin. If if you're in a, a group, you're less easy to eat than if you're uh, all by yourself. Um, there was a study done. Uh, I have my freshman read it on Piranha. It's a easy to find, like two page study on um, Piranha. And if you take these these Piranha, which are if you think about your preconceived notions, they're they're this vicious predator that that uh, probably afraid of nothing and can devour a whole cow in you know four point five seconds or whatever you might think. Uh, but if you pull one of those Piranha out of the group. And make it think it's about to be eaten, it freaks out and it, it, its heart rate goes up and its breathing rate goes up for an extended period of time. It's on, on edge. It's on, it thinks it's about to be eaten. It has no defense, uh, other than its own teeth. But if you put it into a group and the same fake predator attacks, then, uh, their heart rate or their breathing rate goes up for a much shorter amount of time and they recover back to baseline much faster. Uh, because when they're within the group, chances are they're not the one about to be eaten. <laughs> it's likely to be someone else. And, and so they, they uh, calm down a little faster that way. So we can see cooperation in a group in that sense being good for self-preservation, which in turn leads to group preservation, which is kind of interesting. I think that's the point. A lot of people see... Uh evolution as an individual when actually we never talk about pacific when we say we have in the scientific community never talk about the individual in terms of steve or kai how we evolve it's more like on a species level right and an individual cannot evolve by definition once you're born you're you are who you are but a population evolves over time it's the change in alleles and and you know if we're measuring it that way change in uh, alleles change in and what genes are in that population over a period of time uh if we're going to 
please don't make me teach Hardy Weinberg equilibrium on the on the podcast though. <laughs> no, I just wanted to I just wanted to clarify because some people, you know, may not say well, what we're we talking about. There are some I have heard in in certain sort of Silicon Valley style talks the power of like evolution, which we're really talking about epigenetics. Uh in case you haven't heard of epigenetics, uh, if you're listening, it's the interaction between genetic material and your environment. A lot of the time and it's quite a recent field or recent in the sense that there has been increased interest in the last, say, ten years or so in it. And we had previously held that everything, well, the most important element was, was the genes, and they still are very important. But then we realized that the environment interacts with genes in a certain way. Uh, there was, unfortunately, the experiment of uh, the Dutch people during World War II where their food supplies were withheld, and then there was an impact on their, their genetic expression uh, in subsequent generations because they worried about starvation on some kind of subconscious level so they could see there was a genetic difference between one generation and the next just or just because or because of that period of prolonged starvation where they actually had to ground bulbs to to eat them so epigenetics is something that yes you can you can override some elements of of potential expressions of uh genetic behavior we don't understand to what extent but that certainly isn't the evolution that steve is is talking about yeah, this is on the uh, fuzzy edge of my understanding, not being a... Well, you need Massimo Piliucci is who you need to talk to about this. <laughs> but uh, um, epigenetics, yeah, it, like our genes interact with the environment all the time. Like if I'm not fed well and I have the genes to be six foot tall, but I'm not fed well and I'm only five five, you know, I don't think that's... Ex you know, that that's not exactly what we're talking about. But like you said, a trait that's then heritable from one generation to the next, not because your DNA has changed directly, but because maybe um, the uh, proteins that your DNA wraps around have been modified slightly or hmm. uh, a, a different, uh, there, there's, there's little changes made, uh, not directly to the DNA, but perhaps in how it's packaged that ex change how genes are expressed in the future. Uh, so the DNA stays the same, but characteristics of the organisms change slightly in next generations. That's my understanding uh, yeah. of, of epigenetics. And I think it's fascinating when you think about the environment because uh, you say, okay, is it is the environment that's important or is it genes? And you say, well, the way that we have constructed, say, the, say the urban environment has changed what we regard as important. So so when the environment, if the environment is as, as key or certainly very important in terms of genetic expression, I think it is also important to ask ourselves, well, how do we want our society to, to look? How do we want society to express itself if we know that it does modify our behaviors and it does have some bearing on who is seen as successful or not? in terms of um, society and subsequently who we think is quote unquote worthy of of mating with and i think actually it was it was Mass, you know massimo who says that we are as stoics uh selfish through being selfless so so uh, did you want to unpack that thinking using that power of reason to think what would be better than what we always naturally want to do what what we're inclined to do uh and and to uh override that to then have a better society, or if you're going to approach it from a from a uh, more of a Epicurean side, you might say, "Well, I'm just going to detach from this society and 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 uh, use my power of reason that way." But I think uh, the philosophy uh, uh, of Stoicism allows us to to investigate what it is that we're naturally drawn to do. Uh, you know, are we trying to have babies with everyone around us or is monogamy going to be better for society or 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 you know that's just one example but what what approach should we take uh using that rationality and reason to override those evolutionary drives to to live as uh eudaimonic a life as possible yeah, and our, flourish, our flourishing depends on the flourishing of others, I would say. Sure. Uh, even, even if you're wealthy, they say it's not what you know, it's who you know. So if we use that expression, I'm not saying that it's necessarily completely accurate, but if those that are flourishing around you, it doesn't just mean in terms of wealth, but in terms of their educational level, their, their access to resources, which allows them to flourish, not necessarily in eudaimonic sense, but certainly in the social status, then you're more likely to flourish. I mean, I simplify it, but we can see the connection there. So if the, your group... 
your tribe is flourishing, you are more likely to flourish, you're more likely to get opportunities. If we take it to the eudaimonic, uh, you know, much more stringent approach, then if, if society is, I would say, more equal and I have greater access to resources, then I'm more likely to be able to approach statehood because if i'm being shot at in my local neighborhood it's very difficult for me to think oh actually i'd like to be a sage and the first thing i like to think is i have to duck out of the way you have to focus much more on those basic human necessities rather than thinking big and uh and meditating on the human condition if you're if you're trying just to not get shot every day exactly but there are a lot of people in unfortunately the u.s where we're not saying that they couldn't be a sage and like once you are a sage that wouldn't bother you but on your road to being a sage that you know, this uh, tension point between crossing one street and being in one neighborhood or, or not would otherwise occupy your mind now aristotle would say it would make it impossible for you to be a sage that you couldn't be one and i would argue no it's less likely everyone has a capacity to be a sage everyone who has neuro neurotypical reasoning um and doesn't have a say a brain injury but the likelihood of of being able to think about eudaimonia and to make decisions or being able to form impressions that are rational depend on, on quite a large extent to the chaos or lack of chaos going on around you so i think that's why when you think okay if i want to achieve eudaimonia then society around me has to flourish not necessarily in a eudaimonic sense but certainly there has to be a, a reduction in uh, unjust practices and certainly certainly uh, you can't uh, experience eud eudaimonia at the cost of the society around you <laughs> <laughs> absolutely I mean that's a great point can you unpack that more I like that I never thought about it before <laughs> if you are uh, neglecting your neighbors in order to uh, reflect more on your own happiness <laughs> uh, at, some, in, at some level that's going to cost you or if you if you are uh, uh, taking food, more food than your share and causing your neighbor to suffer in that way um, in order to give yourself more time to read Seneca, uh, you know, that you might, you might achieve more wisdom in some sense, but your justice gauge is getting near empty at that point. And therefore, you, you, you basically bar yourself from enjoying Udivania because you didn't follow the virtues. Uh, so it's very difficult because people might say yeah, that's a very simple one, like, oh, should I take from my neighbor? It's much harder to say, should I have Bangladeshi sweatshops? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a much harder thing. Yeah, the, the, the easy parables are easier to, <laughs> to follow. But yeah, if, if I buy this, this widget, am I causing a, uh, a child in, in some country I have never heard of? to uh, live a shorter life <laughs> uh, or, or to, to, uh, to be taken from their family or a tree to, or a forest to be cut down. There's a lot of possible implications there. Uh, and, and our circles of concern obviously are, uh, should extend much larger than our neighbor next door. I mean, I mean, that's that's the difficult thing because then you start saying, well, does that mean that anything like nothing I do is is good enough? You know, what what should I what should I do then? I mean, and I, I say, a stoic, you have an obligation to look at the facts. So if we take into say a Bangladeshi sweatshop, you say I can't afford to buy clothes say that are made in, made in Europe. I know the U.S. is a little bit more flexible on that, but certainly people have said to me, I can't afford to uh, buy clothes that are made in Europe. So I, I then say, well, buy less clothes then because you're contributing less, mm -hmm. right? It, you know, I know that it is, you, or nothing in stores and you're either a sage or you're not, but there are degrees of progress. So next time you think about buying an item that you may not need, you can question, do I need another t-shirt? Do <laughs> I identify with those practices? And we did talk about the environment one, but we didn't really go into to social issues. So I just wanted to ask you what you got from the article if if a whole lot of of folks in a community were stoic uh or 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 progressing towards sagehood on at some level you know you might presume that there would be a trickle down effect on the society uh of oh they're all practicing justice fortitude uh all of these things and and that's affecting their their society to some to some level uh but um i was going to ask you are are you um uh, looking for something more cohesive than individuals practicing 
their their four virtues? Or are you looking for something a little more unifying uh, to get everyone uh, moving in a particular direction? Yeah, I wanted people to understand the nature of, of how society develops. And there's a really good book by Jeremy Lent uh, called The Passion and Instinct that talks about why, for example, the Chinese went around the world without colonizing, whereas the Europeans went and colonized everything, even though the action was the same. To so understand the nature of culture and how that makes us uh, have ideas that may not necessarily be true, but we've kind of been brought up brought up by them. So, for example, here in Portugal, they'll say, oh, you're British, that's amazing. But if you're, say, Brazilian, then they might say, oh, you're Brazilian. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so my, my, my ideas are more accepted because I'm British. And I'm like, why? Because historically, there's been this dominance by the British who have, have only really tried to occupy their own vested interests. So I'm trying to encourage people to look a little bit further, to go a bit deeper. Uh, one thing that I really liked was the response by a female Stoics. They've been quite silent, really, with my work, uh, although I had been look, looking at the environment. And a lot of them said, finally, uh, this is the Stoicism that I understand. And I was thinking, oh, my gosh. And all these women were very happy with me because I mentioned something like the gender pay gap. Right. And that it, it, it does exist on, in some form or another, although I think it is reducing, at least in the West. And that something made me realize that if we want more women in stoicism, then we have to address their issues and give them the space and opportunity to contribute. Now, we, do, we say, oh, well, we give them the space. But if you don't show you an interest in the things that concern them, they don't feel necessarily that they can contribute. Right. right? And, and I, going back to that idea of trickle down, <laughs> trickle down sagehood or tri trickle down uh, virtues, um, it's probably not enough for several of us to say, well, we're opposed to uh, a, a wage gap between genders and to, and to make sure if we are the boss, we don't cause that to happen. But in this case, um, it may be the job of the Stoic to, to uh, write a letter, to, to, uh, to uh, speak up, to actually join a protest, which some Stoics might say, well, that's trying to change things that we don't have power to, to change. Uh, but we want to be careful not to fall into the uh, Epicurean mindset and detach from uh, the world around us, but but uh, we have the power to influence in certain uh, circumstances, and we are called to actually use that power. I'd say, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're I mean, the Epicureans they they were they quite restricted membership in the sense that you had to have a garden, right? And if you couldn't afford a garden, it was a little bit difficult. Uh, the Stoics were a stoa; they were in the marketplace. Where did politics happen previously? It would be things like the marketplace that, you know, the, the town would organize and they would have discussions there. So to say that there's, for example, that stoicism is not political it is actually a misunderstanding of, I think, the history of stoicism and the people like Seneca were quite political by definition. Cicero was uh, quite yeah. political by definition. Uh, Rufus was not particularly political, but he was exiled. So he was part of the political process. Aurelius was, an, was the Roman emperor. I mean, how political can you get? So I think one thing is to say, and I, you know, distance, you know, I would distance myself as a stoic to say, I am absolutely always 100% left or 100% right. It's really looking at who's having, you know, what are they arguing? Is there, is that a reasonable argument based and grounded in facts? The same as, you know, did we, did we breathe with Neanderthals? Yes. And you can say whatever you like about how you don't believe it or you do believe it, but it's, it's a fact. We have it in, you, you were like 2%, 3% Neanderthal, right? Right. So to say that it's apolitical is a misclassification, I think, of what Stone is about. We it's are a measurement. By nature. <laughs> yeah. We are political. We've always been like as a as a community and i say we because I, I really do include myself in that but uh i think sometimes you can say if, does that mean that i should always align with say the left because they tend to talk about social justice more not necessarily i mean i'll give you an example brexit uh, they voted in the uk to leave and a lot of the left wing have been saying the british people haven't spoken in fact uh, richard dawkins said Oh, the British people haven't, you know, have the British people spoken? No, they haven't. Well, in democracy, if 51% of people vote something, then yes, the British people have spoken. <laughs> so that's an example of the left wing in the UK going against what I would call democracy is the majority vote. Now, does, that, does that mean that Brexit is good or bad for the country? 
Well, that time will tell. But it does mean if I start arguing on the left that it's not fair and we should have another referendum until I get the result I want, then, then that's not very democratic either. And that's an example of where maybe there's, there's an injustice because if you believe in democracy and you want to promote those values, then spending a year, well, two years now and a half arguing about the result is something that would be, you know, I would say anti stoic say, well, you, you, you've said that you want democracy. Okay, here's how democracy works. Does that mean that Stokes necessarily would always want a democracy? Not necessarily, but that's something they would have to discuss. Is democracy the best way to, to progress in virtue? And then you'd have a Socratic debate, and then you'd have the reasons as to why it was or it wasn't, depending on the context, depending on the people who empower or, or the people who empowered to make decisions. And so it's not as clear cut. And then people say, well, then I don't know. You, you're basically not giving me an answer. Uh, but Sto- who said Stoicism was easy? <laughs> right. I never said there was a, you know, that Stoics should be a certain wing. In fact, I, I think it's safe to say I would say avoid it. Avoid it. Obviously, you have to vote. So at that point, you can't avoid it. But avoid it and always advocate for reason. So if you see that there's a gender pay gap, instead of just ignoring it or saying it doesn't exist or it's because women, uh, they're less assertive, why don't you do a bit bigger, you know, dig a little bit deeper. There are multivariate analyses by the British government in 2017 to show that for the same job, for the same experience, for the same age, same across everything except gender, there is a clear gender pay gap in certain professions, right? So when I dug deeper, I have to say, well, I can see it. I, I can see it. And then people said, oh, well, um, for example, Jordan Peterson said, but it's not to do with gender, it's to do with behavior. But if a woman and a man uh, have the same behavior and a woman is punished, she's seen as difficult, she's seen as uh, judgmental or argumentative, and a man does the same thing but is seen as a leader, seen as someone that you should encourage and reward, then there is a gender pay gap by definition because the very things that make the woman, you know, seen as less worthy of a promotion are the same things that make a man more worthy of a promotion. So I think the Stokes is very, you know, it's... It's not to just take a, a line and say, I agree with that and I'm never going to change position, but look, you know, consistently reevaluate facts and look at facts and not just opinion. Yeah, I was I was going to read a little quote here from your from your blog post, if I may. Um, a stoic is called to advocate for reason and take the side of the person expressing a reasonable argument. That is to say, one which is grounded in measurable facts and not mere conjecture. Everything else is superfluous to a Stoic's political identity. And I was going to say that in American elections, a lot of times, uh, like I remember when John Kerry was running for president, they said he was waffling because, and I don't remember even what the topic was. And, and uh, I just remember this as an example. He, over over the years or over a campaign or whatever it was, he switched his opinions on certain topics. And they say, well, look, he's ungrounded. He doesn't stand up for what he believes in. So in America, you're often seen as as soft if you change your mind on something. Um, whereas if you if you're as long as you're changing your mind based on facts rather than, you know, where the money's coming from or something, it's actually a, a very good thing. <laughs> And I think it's it's scary to it's actually uh, I would say coming from a, comes from sort of a religious origin of not being able to change one mind, which is ironic because the word repent is to change one's position. When you say I repent, it means I change my position, I change my mind. What I used to indulge in, say, if I was taking a Christian or a Judo Islamic, what I cho- chose to indulge in before, I no longer choose to indulge in because I now understand that that position was wrong. So it's quite strange to me that. It's usually the religious right that try to make everyone's, you know, oh, you can't change your opinion. Uh, or Stoicism, for example, can't change. We have to see what Epictetus said. And I, I'm like, this philosophy is a living, breathing thing as long as people are alive. And if we do anything different, it will ossify. So, you know, could I change my opinion on whether there's a gender pay gap tomorrow? Yes, I absolutely could. You show me the evidence and I will gladly change my mind because you've gone out of your way to present me with evidence, or not necessarily me personally, but certainly the scientific community. What I, what I struggle with is that um, there were Stokes that were arguing, well, which side of the debate should I should I you know favour? Well, not necessarily either of them. If neither of the debate really appealed to what you're reading, 
and you're discussing with, you know, sometimes you might not be academic, not be able to read everything, but you can certainly discuss and come to your own sort of understanding of a topic. So that's the kind of thing I was trying to uh, convey in that blog piece, that we need to open up stoicism so that women can um, participate and if you are a female stoic and you'd like to write with me, please, please email me. I'd love to hear from you. I spoke a little bit to Sky Cleary. She wrote with Massimo last week, but she is, uh, doesn't work in stoicism. But I would really like to discuss sort of some of the issues that why there's not many, say, female philosophers. There really aren't many. And, you know, what stoicism needs to do for you in order for you to engage more. And I feel quite bad saying it like you and it's a, I'm a man, but it's very difficult for me to find female philosophers in Stoicism. I know that we have a few with Anna, Julia Annas and Nassbaum, but they're not specifically Stoic. So yeah, I would love to hear from you. Uh, I'd love to hear any of your ideas and or even criticisms, uh, because I think that's how we move forward. And I would not like to think that Stoicism in the next 20 years just becomes more Silicon Valley Stoicism and less open debate, because I, I think that that's because we're a stoa, that it is about debate and it is about bringing the philosophy down to the marketplace and the marketplace to give ideas back to the philosophers. And I hope that it stays that way. And and for the reader or the listeners who haven't read the blog post, I'd like to to uh, talk about that dichotomy between the stoicism that you're speaking of and the, uh, Silicon Valley stoicism, as you call it, um, which is which is very much the um, We've hinted at it throughout the podcast here, but very much the uh, philosophy of self improvement, uh, of self help, of of becoming more. I almost think of it as more dominant in the workforce, <laughs> or uh, more uh, more successful, uh, versus a stoicism that leads to um, more cooperation, more um, more uh, focusing on 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 community and justice, and 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 in your case, expanding it even into the environment, which I think is necessary it may have been a lot easier to be a stoic in the roman times when there weren't as many people uh, <laughs> because we were impacting the planet quite like we are well, it's now. funny you should say in the roman period they actually had a lot of lead mines and the way that they mine lead so the greenland cores actually you can see the contamination is is higher than uh, until we get to the industrial revolution so it wasn't until the industrial revolution that we surpassed the roman uh, toxicity levels so although we say that because there were less people obviously the the impact of certain uh, activities with lack of health and safety were actually pretty high the problem is now is that i would argue is that global i mean rome was quite the, the empire was quite globalized in, in, the, in the true sense of the word back then, but it's even more globalized now. And we, basically, when we don't see things happening, it's like out of sight, out of mind. And as a stoic, it's not it's not an excuse anymore. So we're outside out of mind. We have the internet everywhere, uh, or more or less everywhere. And we have really got an obligation to, to really look at these issues. And I understand a lot of you are going to say, but I don't have time to look at everything. OK, I'm not saying look at every single thing. I'm saying pick something, say it's environmental. We spoke about, you know, two weeks ago. Uh, well, this recording could go out later, but it's two weeks ago in terms of real time for me. But this is like, um, now I was thinking, what about the social issues? And it was just really nice to get the response that finally there is a stoicism that talks to me. And I was like, this is not finally. This has always been the case. It's just been, a, it's not, I wouldn't say it's been hijacked. I mean, it hasn't. It's just been adopted by a community that is very successful at getting its ideas out. The people that use it are using it because they want to be more successful and they were already successful anyway. So people who are in marketing, of course, they're going to market that idea. That's their day job. It's like my day job is being academic, same as yours, Steve. So of course, we're going to be interested in, say, biology, the environment, social issues, because they're linked to sustainability. So it's, quite, it's also a call upon the rest of the community to say, if you want to, you know, stoicism to evolve, then you also need to invest in what stoicism means to you. And there's something that I can't you know, touch because I don't understand it. And there's for example, even the gender issue. I mean, I, I feel bad <laughs> at discussing it from a male point of view when I much feel much more comfortable if there were, say, a group of us that were really looking at how do we incorporate uh, what has traditionally been issues linked to uh, to women, but not necessarily, or certainly the oppressed. Um, but it is a challenge because you're always going to, at the moment, you're coming up against post-truth where 
somebody else's truth is more important than than mine, even if mine's based in facts because they're based in popular opinion. So as a stoic, it is difficult to do that, and that's why Twitter and Facebook can be quite dangerous because the algorithm will take you wherever you let it take you. So it's also going out and about and really asking people, you know, how do you feel about that? Like Me Too, how do you feel about Me Too? Is that something you've experienced or is that something that I just heard about in the newspapers and powerful men have denied? So yeah, you do have to get out and about and you, that's why you have to go out in the store. That's also why I've called philosophers, you know, and be, people in academia in general, get out into the marketplace, bring your ideas to the table. And this is the great opportunity to get on the podcast, which is why I love being on there, because otherwise some of you will not hear that others like, say, Steve and I are discussing the justice issues or the self-control issues or how, uh, how we can become more effective with wisdom. Thank you once again, Kai Whiting, for joining the podcast. So what can we learn from our conversation? Stoicism is a highly effective tool for helping us psychologically to engage with the world. It can make us better at whatever we do, whether that be business, or being a parent, or just being a good citizen of the world. And while it's tempting to often focus inward and make ourselves better, we can only improve to a point if we don't turn our attention outward and work on justice, work on the well-being of our fellow human beings, at least as much as within our, at least as much as within our power to control. So we cannot become virtuous individually at the cost of the well-being of our neighbors. We cannot withdraw so much from the world to improve ourselves as to then negatively impact the world around us. And as Kai suggests, that, that expands beyond just our neighbor next door, but the entire globe, the entire biosphere is something we need to have concern for if we are going to be good citizens of the world. So at all times, we don't have an excuse to accept injustice. If someone is doing the same job as you are and doing just as well or better than you are, and they are not being compensated equally, perhaps that is something you need to speak up about. All of these things will require you to use your own wisdom to determine the best course of action, when to speak up, when not to speak up, when to help, and when to accept something as being completely out of your ability to change. Thank you for listening to the Sunday Stoic Podcast. You can contact the show at sundaystoic at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail for the show at 501 503-3132 and keep in touch by following us on Facebook and Twitter you can support the show by donating on Patreon www.patreon.com slash sundaystoic you can also help us out by rating us on iTunes or whichever podcast provider you use thank you for your support Carpe Diem Carpe Diem